Oftentimes, the success or failure of radical right parties is purportedly hinged on unemployment or immigration rates or the supposed failure of political elites to listen to the demands of the populace. Little attention is thus paid to political and civil ideological circumstances that parties operate in and subsequently liberate or limit their ability to recruit supporters. In fact, the inner party workings, conditioned and exacerbated by the wider cultural environment, can and do severely limit a party's ability to operate within a democracy. Let Germany be our example today. The rise of the AFD within the past five years has been a monumental shock to the German system. Perhaps more shocking though is that it hadn't happened sooner. To the west, the Front National had become a staple of French politics. In Belgium, Vlaams Bloc and Vlaams Belang had rocked the political establishment. In the Netherlands, the rise of Pim Fortuyn and subsequently Kurt Wilders made the radical right a staple of party politics. The most popular party in Switzerland was the populist Swiss People's Party. To the north, the Danish People's Party were constant kingmakers and to the southeast, Austria had the FPOA and the BZOA to contend with. In Germany, up until 2013, all was virtually silent. Three parties, excluding the AFD, have been of note in Germany. The NPD, the National Democratic Party, the DVU, the German People's Union, and the Republicans. Apart from sporadic success in state elections, none of these parties have entered the Bundestag and remain ideologically extreme. This is mostly due to the extremely repressive environment any party to the right of the CDU CSU has had to contend with. How best to conceptualise Germany's Nazi past has been a topic of ferocious debate in the country. Immediately following the war, Chancellor Adenauer of the CDU sought reconciliation with former NSDAP party members, scrapped extensive denazification programmes and aimed to reintegrate them into society, provided they rebuke past associations and in no way aimed to undermine the Republic's newly founded democratic ideals. The German Federal Republic, founded as a militant democracy in 1949, began to view the recent Nazi past as an aberration. A few militant crazies had taken the reins of government and the vast majority of Germans were helpless victims of both the crazies at the top but also the allies who sought to defeat them. There was more or less a political consensus that Germany's Nazi period was over, that mistakes had been made but would not be repeated and certainly issues surrounding the Holocaust were mute in public discourse. About this time, numerous right-wing parties emerged. The German Party, the German Rights Party, which became the German Reich Party, the Federation of the Expellees and Disenfranchised, and the Socialist Party of the Reich are most notable. None of these parties ever became nationally significant, with only the Federation of the Expellees and Disenfranchised ever getting over 5% of the vote, in 1953. The environment towards these parties was relatively permissive, provided they weren't overtly national socialist. Indeed, the saturation of the political marketplace meant that none could count on consistent electoral success, and tensions within parties between more moderate national conservatives and unreconstructed Nazis made progress difficult. Indeed, it was through this ideological chasm that the Socialist Party of the Reich were founded, as National Socialist members of the Reich Party splintered to found the more explicitly National Socialist Socialist Party, who were subsequently banned in 1953. Point is, these parties did not, in general, face inordinate external pressure and were generally dealt with by offering more cushy jobs to party operatives within the right-wing CDU, through Adenauer's policy of reintegration. This meant the moderates fled these parties, handing them over to the extremists, which would in turn increase state pressure and electoral alienation. The 60s saw the collapse of German consensus over how best to view the Nazi past. The dawn of the new left in university campuses and a burgeoning and violent left-wing street movement spearheaded the political debate. The conservative CDU was the pushback and instead held continuity with Adenauer, the New Left, on the contrary, sought about outing former National Socialist University professors and undermining the basis of German society, which they saw, rooted in the works of Adorno and the Frankfurt School, as forming the seed from which the Nazi terror had sprung. Rejecting all authority was an explicit necessity, precisely due to Germany's latent Nazism. 
Indeed, this increased polarization of German society over issues of its Nazi past pushed CDU Chancellor Kurt Georg Kiesinger in 1969 to state that Weimar fell into Nazi hands due to ideological division amongst the populace, and the violent left-wing activists seeking to sow discord were, in actual fact, recreating the conditions that made Nazism possible. Meanwhile, the far right began to consolidate itself. Poor electoral performance proved cause for a strategic re-evaluation. Numerous disparate groups led by the German Reich Party consolidated to form the National Democratic Party of Germany in 1964, initially intended to be a national conservative outfit to the right of the CDU. The party was led by the German Reich Party's Adolf von Thaden, but wary of having a far-right politician at the helm, he decided it was better to have the more moderate Fritz Thielen, a former CDU politician, steer the ship lest the German state attempt to close the party. By 1965, the party was able to reinvigorate networks claimed by previous far-right political parties and built a membership base in the thousands. But hopes were dashed when in that year's elections, the party barely managed to scrape 2%. Then, opportunity struck. The Socialist Party entered government for the first time in 1965, but not alone. The CDU retained its position and chancellorship, resulting in Germany's first grand coalition of the centre-left and centre-right. The NPD was now able to claim to be the only genuine right-wing opposition, illustrated with the party slogan, One Can Vote Again, and led to a string of successful state election showings. It was basically a given that, come the 1969 Bundestag elections, the NPD would overcome the 5% threshold and enter parliament. Indeed, the left-leaning newspaper Die Zeit reported in 1968, In the fall of 1969, after the parliamentary election, the president will have to welcome a new party and a new parliamentary party leader to the parliament hall, Adolf von Thaden, and his men of the NPD. There is almost no doubt about this. The only thing that is still unclear is precisely how many National Democrats will enter parliament, whether 25, as opinion pollers say, or 50, as optimists in the NPD central office suspect. This never materialised. The party obtained 4.6% of the vote and failed to gain entry. The party began a process of decline and infighting ran rampant. Von Thaden had retaken control of the party from Thielen in 1967, forcing thousands of moderates to leave, including Thielen himself in 1967, lamenting the rise of extremist elements within the party. Moreover, a growing faction of extremists disillusioned with parliamentary democracy after the 1969 disaster posed an increasing threat even to von Thaden himself. Rallies became increasingly violent and a party group known as Action Widerstand became increasingly street-focused and aggressive, as younger, more radical elements flooded the party. In the end, even von Thaden left. In 1972, the party obtained less than 1% in the federal elections, the extremists had won, and the party was a fringe and irrelevant pariah. The 1980s was probably the most decisive decade in German history over which approach to take with respect to its past. The 40th anniversary of the war's end sparked fierce debate between left and right over whether it should be remembered as a day of liberation or a national tragedy. Indeed, this was one of the most important national issues of the time, as the writer Heinrich Boll stated. You will always be able to distinguish Germans by whether they describe May the 8th as the day of defeat or the day of liberation. One CSU politician claimed, May the 8th was and is one of the saddest days in the experience of our nation, a day of profound humiliation. The day of the unconditional surrender of the German army was for millions of German people who were as innocent as anyone else who suffered under National Socialist rule, the beginning of imprisonment and internment of looting and rape of retribution and expulsion, of hunger and death. This narrative was countered by the increasingly parliamentarily strong left wing. The new left movement of the 60s and 70s now had Bundestag representation in the form of the Green Party. For them, and many of the SPD and FDP, May the 8th was a day of national freedom and, finally, the dawn of a German democracy. 
The situation reached almost government-destroying heights when CDU Chancellor Helmut Kohl invited President Reagan to a memorial ceremony in Bitburg to commemorate the end of the war and the reconciliation between the two countries. Symbolically, this was a big deal, the culmination of the CDU's goal of drawing a line under the Nazi past and moving forward. In fact, the opposite happened and the whole thing was a disaster. Turned out that the cemetery where the memorial was planned to take place was home to the bodies of Waffen-SS soldiers. Not only did mass protests take place in Germany, but also America. Reagan worsened the situation when he defended the visit thusly. There are 2,000 graves there, most of those, the average age is about 18. I think that there's nothing wrong with visiting that cemetery where those young men are victims of Nazism also, even though they were fighting in the German uniform, drafted into surface to carry out the hateful wishes of the Nazis. They were victims just as surely as the victims in the concentration camps. The issues with us, should a line be drawn under the Holocaust? To what extent were Germans victims of the Second World War? And can their victimhood even remotely be compared to those of the Holocaust? The cuts and fissures ran deep in German society. In the end, the commemoration took place, Five minutes in the rain to the audio backdrop of shouting protesters. The beginnings of consensus were about to be reached, however. On the 8th of May 1985, President Weizsäcker of the CDU was to deliver a speech that would become the most famous in the history of the Federal Republic. For the first time ever, a German statesman publicly commemorated the suffering of non-Germans during the war, including Jews, gypsies, homosexuals and the mentally ill. Rather than framing contrition as antithetical to national identity, he presented it as an integral part of it, and a crucial means to strengthen German democracy. By the mid-90s, this became a bipartisan viewpoint, as the right regrew and, unsuccessfully, had another resurgence. In 1983, Defence Minister Franz Josef Strauss supported a loan of over 10 billion Deutschmark to the Eastern German Democratic Republic. This was in sharp contrast to the party's long-standing policy of refusing to stabilise the Democratic Republic. The result was two prominent CSU MPs splitting from the party, and together with prominent talk show host Radio Franz Schonhuber, creating their own, the Republicans. Originally, the idea was to create a sort of federal CSU, which has always limited itself to Bavaria and coupled with the CDU. Franz Schonhuber had other ideas though, and instead wished to model the party more closely to Jean-Marie Le Pen's Front National in France. In the end, attempts were made to expel Schonhuber, which failed and resulted in his co-founders leaving. Schonhuber was elected leader who in turn appointed former NPD member Harald Neubauer as party secretary, solidifying the party's radical right direction. Schonhuber was himself a controversial figure. In 1981, he published a book entitled I Was There, detailing his experience in the Waffen-SS in positive terms, which earned him reams of negative press. Indeed, one of the central themes of the Republicans was coming to terms with the country's Nazi past and finding some positive in it. By the late 1980s, establishment parties and politicians were increasingly becoming unanimous in thinking a culture of contrition most appropriate and that a never-forget attitude to German atrocities and the uniqueness thereof were morally imperative. As members of both the CSU and CDU began to embrace this outlook, Politicians who thought otherwise only had the far right left for support, where none wished to journey. Consequently, not only did the rise of the Republicans help consolidate the culture of contrition, as disagreeing with it became associated with extremist sensibility, but also made it increasingly difficult for a party right of the CSU to gain a foothold. In 1989, the Republicans had their first major electoral break. The West Berlin Senate elections awarded them a staggering 7.8% of the vote. This was met with fierce protests by Green and SPD activists. On the 20th of April, Green Party activists mockingly gave Republican politicians a cake to commemorate the birthday of their Führer. Indeed, life was made increasingly difficult for party activists. In 1989, just prior to the Berlin state elections, the party had over 25,000 members. Just one year later, they faced a 40% drop, which was blamed by Republican politicians on the mounting social pressures that members faced. This selected against moderates joining the party and instead favoured extremist elements, 
who enjoyed political confrontation and otherwise had little else to lose from being in a severely socially stigmatised political organisation. Sean Huber himself decried his party becoming overrun with NPD members and himself stepped down, only to be almost immediately re-elected. He led a purge of the party to expunge the NPD extremists, which then he undermined by agreeing to a meeting with Gerhard Frey of the German People's Party in 1994, who we shall come to next. Not only was stigma high on Republican members, but also on members of the CDU and CSU who even considered working with them. Any proposal put forward by Republicans in state parliaments were voted down out of principle, and anyone who violated this principle was ejected from their respective party. Indeed, justification for this was always linked to the Nazi past and its trivialization by the Republicans. It was at this point in German history that the culture of contrition truly took hold and became the political juggernaut that it is today. The Republicans still exist, but since the mid-90s have never been politically relevant and most likely never again will be. In 1987, the multi-millionaire right-wing publisher Gerhard Frey founded the German People's Union or the DVU. The party is now officially aligned with the NPD after a merger in 2011, but has always been, for all intents and purposes, a ghost party, able to obtain sporadic electoral success thanks to the money of its founder. In the 1987 Bremen elections, the party spent more than all of the other parties combined and still only garnered barely 3%, but did have subsequent success throughout the early 90s, surpassing the 5% threshold on the state level on two occasions. The fall of the Berlin Wall provided greater opportunity. The east of the country never went through the fierce ideological debate and consensus building around Germany's Nazi past, and there was thus less stigma and social ostracism associated with involvement with such groups. Moreover, the collapse of youth organisations and leisure facilities presented an opening for far-right activists to fill the void. The DVU subsequently have always fared better to the east, gaining almost 13% of the vote in the Saxony-Anhalt elections of 1998 and 6% in Brandenburg in 2004. These flurries of electoral success, however, have always been followed by party infighting and the collapse of the parliamentary group, owing to the party's poor organisational structure and untrained party cadre. The NPD have similarly seen a ripe opportunity in the East, and thousands of activists migrated eastwards looking for young minds to join their ranks. Udo Voigt became party leader in 1996 and oriented the party towards a more anti-capitalist bent in a bid to bring more respectability to the party. This strategy worked and by 2004 the party had won almost 10% of the vote in Saxony and 7% in Mecklenburg West Pomerania. However, it did pose a contradiction. The party simply didn't have the activist base available to carry out election campaigns without courting the support of the more extreme right youth. The party thus attempted to moderate while simultaneously recruiting from neo-Nazi street movements to aid with campaigning. These youths have been encouraged to drop the boots and braces and instead work towards establishing youth clubs, discos and community centres, successfully integrating themselves firmly into the fabric of life in many towns and villages. Indeed, although electoral success for the party is scanty at best, and dreams of entering the Bundestag incredibly remote, the party does have a pool of loyal supporters and locales where the party will remain firmly entrenched. Numerous attempts to ban the party have been enacted, with the most notable case failing in 2003, after it was revealed that most of the evidence used against the party was created by informants within it. Indeed, some German politicians have argued against banning the party precisely because it is so well infiltrated and serves to provide valuable intelligence on extreme right activities. Maybe here I should also note that Adolf von Thaden, the party founder, was also subsequently after his death purported to be an MI6 agent of the British government. The most recent banning attempt was dropped in 2017 after the NPD were considered too insignificant to warrant one. Indeed, the party is back to the political wilderness it experienced in the 70s and 80s. The story of the far right in Germany is a strange one. Hitherto, the country has been without a political force to the right of the CDU that isn't so extreme as to put off voters and attract only the most extreme and alienating ideological elements of German society. 
This has largely been due to the severe political pressure and social stigma put on members of said parties due to the increased prominence of the culture of contrition and also thanks to repeated factional infighting. By the time the Republicans had collapsed in the mid-90s, there was simply no way for the NPD to rehabilitate and form a credible political force. Instead, they became reliant on young skinheads to take their message to the masses, which only further destroyed any long-term success opportunities. The alternative for Deutschland presents, for the first time ever, a viable electoral force in the country. Could this be a legitimate challenge to the culture of contrition and the first party of the Federal Republic to consolidate a space to the right of the CDU? So far, it seems the answer is yes. If so, expect major ideological upheavals, similar to those of the 1980s, to re-enter German consciousness. Thanks a lot for watching this video. If you liked the video, don't forget to click like and please do subscribe if you haven't already. If you didn't click dislike, leave a comment and tell me where I went wrong. As always, huge thank you to all my patrons. It's thanks to you guys that these videos are regular. If you enjoy my content, then please do consider becoming a patron yourself. It's within your means to do so. Once again, guys, thanks a lot and until next time.